Hello, hello, friends. So in today's conversation, we speak with Chris Schreiber. Chris is the head of marketing at Quiller, and he spent over 15 years marketing and selling software products. He started his career at Google, where he created a new category uh, for a product you may know of called Google Docs, before driving marketing teams at high growth software companies like ShareThrough and Brandcast. And in this conversation, we dig into Chris's background in music and playing in bands and how that naturally led to a career in startup tech marketing. Who would have thought? Facets like music, like creating something from scratch are just woven naturally into his career of creating and popularizing new categories of software that people hadn't heard of before. We also dive into the tension of a marketer's job between creating versus capturing demand and balancing between the long-term and short-term thinking. Now, this is a really fun conversation thinking about how Chris approaches these very conflicting approaches to marketing and manages to find a balance in order to bring these products to market and get adoption. Now, without further ado, here's my conversation with Chris. Chris, welcome to the Long Game Podcast. It's great to have you. Thanks so much. Yeah, so we're, we're going to be talking a lot about marketing, long-term thinking, your career, how you think about creating new market categories. But before we get into the, all of the serious stuff, I wanted to start with your music background. You have a degree in music. Tell us how you ended up in tech marketing. <laughs> you know, I, ne- I really never stopped asking myself that question. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I I went to school in New York. I um, I was I was actually a poli sci major, but I had a, a music minor and and have kind of always played in in bands. Um, and uh, I I actually started my career working on the general staff of the Conan O'Brien show um, in New York, and um, it was it was really interesting to be a part of it, but kind of didn't didn't feel like as great like a cultural vibe i guess as i thought i was going to being in in the in the office every day and then um got a interview with google uh on the west coast and and got the opportunity to to work there and so i moved to to san francisco um and i've been here ever since and i was at google for about four years um and music was still like very much my passion like i i was playing in bands um the entire time i was at google and a lot of late nights and a lot, of, a lot of bleary-eyed uh, shuttle rides down yeah. to Mountain View, and and um, definitely not the only uh, Googler <laughs> that played in bands. I like I I had nights where I would I would play like three different acts from from uh, all from like Google people. There's a lot of there's a lot of musicians and, and creatives there. So um, you know I think that drew me to the to the culture, realizing like you know innovation, creativity, sort of original thought was was really like. Um, valued there and those like same skills i think like that draw someone to play music like are very applicable in both like Mm -hmm. tech and marketing um and so you know i think i've always wanted to do work that i could be good at and was sort of like naturally wired for um and so yeah i think there's there's a commonality there between like that which draws me to music and that which has kept me in tech marketing yeah. So you, you don't have to go into detail, but out of curiosity, what what was it about working on the set of Conan that pushed you away from that environment? Yeah. <clears throat> it's um it's also obviously like a super creative um environment. I think, you know, I was I wasn't a part of like the core like creative team at all i was on the general staff and that was very much a like do what needs to be done this day and sometimes it would be like help write the interview for like jay-z and other days it'd be like go to chinatown and get this prop like now (laughs) for the show (laughs) and uh you know i think um it was even if you work like on a on a show or, or on a production you you can you can definitely not be a part of like the sort of creative epicenter. And I saw a lot of people that were like 
very much like wanting to be on that side to, to get sort of a full-time sort of staff writer position or line produ producer position, but we're doing jobs that were very far afield from it, but it's sort of like they yeah. kept those jobs because it kept them close. Um, and to me, it was like that kind of made for a tough environment. Like there was a lot of people that had jobs that they really didn't want, but they were taking them to be close to what they really wanted. And so it just kind of led to like, I don't know, a bit of like an uneasy feel. Yeah. Um, and it's not like that's, you know, totally <laughs> untrue in the tech world either. I think there's a lot of people that, that are wanting something that's not quite their job, but I, I, I don't think it's as drastic as what I saw in the entertainment industry. Yeah, it sounds like, yes, you got some of that creative outlet, but that was maybe a small percentage of the time. Um, and maybe the rest of the time you're doing things not really that were enjoyable. Yeah, I think a lot, a lot of people had, had that yeah. description. All right, so I'm going to jump around a little bit here. So let's jump to present day, where you're currently head of marketing at a Australian tech company. So tell us more about that. What does that entail? Yeah, so I I, um, I work for Quiller. Uh, so it's a um, it's a software company based out of Sydney, Australia. Um, you know, the the company was was founded out of a very sort of like authentic um, sort of problem solving mission by the founder. Um, you know, he ran his own consultancy, and uh, it was a mix of sort of like design development work and and just really didn't enjoy the process of creating proposals. Like he's a very creative person and sort of felt like this is very time consuming and the output is really not what he wanted it to look or sort of the experience of it to feel like. So he created his own essentially like custom solution to essentially like deliver proposals as, as kind of websites and like an interactive experience. And um, you know, a lot of like the people receiving these were like, this is great. I want my proposals to look like this. Like how, how did you do this? and kind of, you know, unexpectedly found a market uh, for it. Um, and, and so that led to uh, really the creation of like a software company to, to give that ability to, to many, many, many people in the world. Um, and so I think we're still very much in that like moment of, of finding the market and raising awareness of, of this um, capability, which is, you know, the ability to create web-based, really kind of customized documents with a lot of kind of important transactional features. So not just like your your typical Google Doc, which is on the web, but um, a, a web page that you can you know, submit pricing, you can take signatures, you can sort of collect payments and do all these sort of like specific actions that businesses need people to take to grow. Um, and so, you know, for us, like, on the you know, getting to the marketing side, it's it's a mix of, of creating demand and capturing demand. Um, you know, there's a much bigger market out there to go create demand among who don't necessarily know that there's these opportunities. You know, in software platforms to create smarter documents and more sort of interactive web-based documents than what they're creating now. So there's a lot of you know, content and, and campaigns and promotional work just to raise awareness and create that demand. And then it's about capturing demand, so that you know it's 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 not a unknown universe either. So those are a lot of um, you know people searching for tools to create better proposals, to have sort of better uh, like sales operations, and so it's about sort of surfacing Quiller within those those searches and those sort of in market buyers. Um, and I think you know we sort of toggle back and forth and, and are working in parallel on, on those two sides, creating and, and capturing demand. Yeah, I imagine it's it takes out the grunt work of creating like a proposal through Microsoft Word and then creating a PDF version or having someone design it, passing it off for signing, and then okay, now we need to go through an invoicing platform. It it sounds like an all-in-one thing that makes it significantly easier than what folks are used to. <clears throat> yeah, that's right on. I mean, I, I yeah. think it definitely like it it um, <clears throat> it coalesces kind of multiple tools that people are are using into kind of one system and. So that's helpful. Like you can take sort of fewer steps. It becomes a little more like um, streamlined to do these things. But the output is also like far, far better than what yeah. your like typical Microsoft Word doc yeah. looks like. So, you know, I think we, I've worked for a number of tech companies. I've really never seen like happier customers um, anywhere I works. Like I, we just have a lot of customers that just 
love this for a lot of reasons. You know, it's saving time. They're looking better in the world, which is, you know, really important as you're sending out sales proposals. And so they're winning more deals and winning them faster. So it's, yeah, it's awesome to see like the customer love. Yeah. No one has time for ugly proposals. Uh, there are enough work as it is. Yeah. Um, but so the, the concept of creating versus capturing demand is really interesting. Before we jump into that piece, this isn't the first time you've done this. So you previously did this at, at Google, creating a new market category back then that plenty of people are familiar with. Tell us about, about what you worked on back then and that sort of category you were creating. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because it, in some ways I almost feel like I've come like full circle in my career because I, I worked on a number of like consumer applications, but um, you know, one of the ones I like really sunk my teeth into the most was, was Google Docs. And so, cause I was really there from like the genesis of the whole thing. We acquired a company called Rightly um, and definitely not well known. Like I, I had never heard of Rightly and it was web-based, you know, um, document creation. And, and so we, I was on the like marketing and communications team, like tasked with launching it and, and raising, you know, creating demand. Cause like, you know, that really was a case study and category creation because we were solving a problem that people didn't know they had. You know, that's yeah. really when you're creating a category is you have to like raise awareness of the problem before you can raise awareness of your solution. You know, I think people kind of accepted Microsoft Docs. It was what it was. There was downsides to it, but there, I don't think there was a sense at that point, you know, we're talking like mid 2000s, like 2006 or so that I was probably really working on this. Like there wasn't an expectation that the document like process could be online. You were doing sort of, you're going to websites and you, you were kind of doing your email. Like a lot of this stuff has just sort of always been downloadable documents. And so, you know, we had to like, to do a lot of work to understand like how do you how do you really sort of preach the value uh of, of this and, and and sort of like you know introduce the problem to then understand you know, help the market understand you're the solution for and a big piece of that is like um <laughs> finding customer stories like finding examples of where people are successful with it and one of the things that kept coming up um, it, from the customer side was like people managing their weddings and people so loved Google people Docs. People were managing their weddings through, those are first, I guess, early adopters of Google Docs. Those people were early weddings. adopters. And that was like, as we started thinking, like, why is there this pattern of, of these super happy customers on like wedding planning? And we were like, Okay, so you're collaborating with a lot of people on totally different time zones, in different geos. Okay, let's think about what the alternative would be. Okay, you've got either a, like a Microsoft doc with like, you know, comments added that yeah. you have to download every time and like people aren't gonna do that. You have like it's a giving me a headache threads. thinking yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a million threads on the email. Like it, yeah, it just, it's brutal. I mean, it's, it's planning a wedding is intense no matter what. So I think people are like, holy shit, like I, our whole family, you know, is on this dock. Like, this is this has just been great for us, um, to, and we've never really done anything like this. But we, you know, it's I think it becomes kind of viral. Someone does it, they're successful at it, and they tell their next friend when they're doing their wedding to do it. And so I think that was one that we like really started to like speak to like the multiple sort of levels of value that you got from this like web-based collaboration. Um, so yeah, I mean that was. That was sort of my first experience, um, like in, in the sort of web-based docs world, as well as kind of like category creation. Um, and so that was fun. Yeah, and yeah, I want to dig more into that. So, creating versus capturing demand. I think capturing demand is pretty straightforward, right? Creating demand is a little bit nebulous, and you mentioned, you know, when you're doing that, you want to capture those early customer stories of success, but regardless of whether it's a startup or an ex existing business creating a new product and creating a new category, what does it take to create demand? Like, how do you think about creating demand for a new category? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, so like April Dunford does like a good, I feel like sort of breakdown yeah. of, of, of this where you know, she really talks about like, are, are you creating a niche 
a new a new niche in an existing market, and thus people are aware of the problems they have, but they're not aware of your solution. Or are you actually creating a new category? And in that sense, you actually have to raise awareness of the problem first, that people don't know they have this problem. And then you're going to lead them to your solution. So it sort of depends, like, where are you at? Are you solving a known problem? Or are you sort of, like, educating people about this problem? Um, and then either way, you know, you've got to show proof that it works. Um, and... You know, that's a big piece of it is like problem awareness, figure out if it's there or not, and then like communicating about solving that problem. Um, and you know, finding the like relevant audiences that, that are highest likelihood to, to have this problem, highest, you know, highest likelihood to uh, be open to trying it, something new. Um, and I think, uh, you know, it, you gotta, it, it does, my experience, like, always come back to examples of success. You know, like, pe people at the end of the day, like, the strongest, like, influence is word of mouth. And you can sort of recreate word of mouth by putting your customer stories out there uh, through multiple facets. Um, so I think, yeah, on a high level, it's, like, something we think about a lot. And, you know, creating versus capturing demand, you still got to, like, you know, meet people where they are on some level. And the question is just like, how actively are they trying to solve that problem right now? Yeah, and you were talking about developing awareness that people even have a pain. Maybe they're just so used to something being the norm, they don't realize this is actually, there's a better way to do this. So let's, let's start from there. In what ways or what methods, maybe even if you want to get tactical, do you get folks to be aware that there's a better way of doing things. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I think, um, think about it for a second in terms of like the most effective ways that I, I've seen it. You want to be a good storyteller and you want to be like a you know, a good communicator so that you can get people to the answers fast and let them start to then like go deeper if they want. Um, and so I think like the way you sort of present, um, you know, stories and information is, is really important to get that like flicker of interest. And I, you know, I do think it's, there's no one size fits all. That's always going to work for every, every company, obviously, like you experiment with, with ads, you experiment with, um, you know, speaking, whether it's events or, or digital, you experiment with, with creating content and like you see like what medium works for the company that you're at. Um, and, and all of it should be sort of tracing back to those like successful customers and the insights that you derived from them. And then it's putting them out in a lot of channels and making it like quick to digest what the win was that this, you know, this person or this like segment had so that people can like see themselves uh within it yeah 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 it sounds like maybe if if it's a brand new category that people aren't familiar with that there may be more outbound involved to get that message out whereas if there's a known problem and you're creating a new niche then there may be some percentage of inbound coming in as well is that right i think that's right yeah, yeah. for sure i mean i think you know the the plus side of like trying to create a new niche uh, and like you know solve a, like a problem that people know they have is like there's a market that exists and you kind of it's a little easier to find people um, and so you know on some level it's like how persuasive and effective are you at convincing them that the problem that they know they have that your solution seems compelling as a new way to try it. The downside is that you're dealing with more competition because it's a known market and a known yeah. problem. And depending on how mature it is, it may be really difficult to break in and surface yourself uh, with, within like people that are searching um, wherever they're you know, looking for things. Yeah. On the other side, it's like if you're trying to create a category and sort of raise awareness of a problem, like most likely people aren't really searching on it today and you have to create that conversation. But... The upside of that is that if you're successful, you're there to take it all. You know, you you are, will be the number one search result, and you will be sort of the like, uh, you know, originator of the conversation. 
and so it's like it's a bigger game it's much harder um but like if you succeed like it's all yours and then others start coming in but you know you saw it first and, and it's, it takes a while for for others to start to break in and that can still happen but um it's two very different modes i think it's way harder to get off the ground on category creation but if you're yeah. successful like the wind the wind is really at your back and it's hard to break in on you know new niches and, and solving existing problems but like you know where to look you know you just start testing and like you can find out pretty quickly like can, can you hold your own within that within that market yeah that's that's really interesting like it's it's hard to get off the ground but if you do it right it's it's succeeding and so i mentioned earlier that creating demand is it might sound a bit nebulous for for some folks but when you're starting out trying to do that how do you measure success and how do you know that there might actually be traction or or if it's you're just pouring money down a drain yeah i mean i think you need to like you need to be interacting with the market like you even if you have something like a totally new product like you need to get people in there and seeing if like if there's a successful experience going on there like it doesn't start with marketing uh you need to validate that like people do love this this is this is solving a need it may it may be solving a problem they didn't know they had but when they start using it they start to realize like oh wow this is so much better i could never go back to the way things were and if you know it's, it's kind of the same playbook in that like you are deriving insights from successful uses of this. It just may be a lot more sort of like user testing and sort of like customer research yeah. based than like actually like a, a thriving like customer base. Um, but you gotta like, it has to be rooted in truth <laughs> um, and, and reality. And then you need to start figuring out like, all right, how do we, where are, what are people searching on today that's related enough and who are who is this market that we think will see this and then start permeating those messages towards them yeah it sounds like maybe early on then when you're trying to figure out whether it's something that you can even create demand for there's some partnership with product yeah i mean i think if it's if there's no truth on no matter what it is if there's no truth at the end of the day of like the product really solving problems and really you know like driving good results then it doesn't matter like the, the marketing will at at best create a bunch of opportunities for conversations yeah. and maybe you can get customers but like there's not you're not really building something and i think that's like way more true even than it than it used to be i, I think like it tech was pretty new and it was like maybe like 10 years ago um to a lot of like businesses in terms of like opportunities for for new types yeah. of categories and people were i think much more open to like taking the story in and hearing sort of these like bigger visions without necessarily like needing to validate it versus now i think we're, we are so often like the the work place is quite sort of tech savvy and tech oriented in their, in their workflow that like i i think there's like a, a higher bar to break in and like people are just going to figure out for themselves if you know if this product is worth their while there's just so many more ways to do that and they're also probably just typically more savvy um with digital tools and so like the, the marketing can only do so much yeah um, it, it it may i wonder if it's also mixing in some really sensitive uh bullshit uh sensories where they can tell when they're being marketed to and a product doesn't actually do what it does um i know so i i worked at hubspot previously and uh one of our co-founders Darmesh, was saying yeah the beginning of hubspot was me writing a blog about inbound marketing we didn't create marketing but we created a concept and we then we created a product around it and folks kind of latched onto that i i doubt that's something that's as easy to do nowadays with all the content that's out there i i mean I, I i think it's totally achievable if there's truth to it you know like that that's a good example of like probably alerting people to a problem that they didn't know they had you know they may yeah. have felt it generally or like i just want more leads but they probably you know back then didn't have as clear thought of like our inbound marketing program is insufficient and like it's a problem and so like you had to sort of like 
get out there and be the thought leader on, yeah, there's this thing called inbound marketing. And it's this collection of, of strategies and tools to, to bring people in. And it's related to like the way the web works. And it's, it was pretty like fresh new thinking at the time. And so, you know, I think it is people like language is really important. So as you're, um, you're trying to create a category like giving people sort of like simple concepts and phrases that they can take with them. Like inbound marketing was a good turn of phrase. You know, that like kind of made sense on its own. It was different. It didn't really sound like other stuff out there. And like pretty quickly, you know, especially with how quickly like things move on the web. Yeah. Becomes like a standardized term. Um, <clears throat> and I think like that's, you can still do that. I think it's harder to do that now but like bringing clarity and bringing language to a thing that you, you generally were feeling but didn't have like a clear sense of what it was like that that's still important yeah um and i i think there's still kind of like lots of opportunities for that because the world is changing like the world is always changing and so as you bring clarity to the like the moment that you're in you're like this pattern is called this and this is sort of you know get it if you get it 80% right, like it can, it can be, it can be meaningful. Um, I don't think that goes away, but I think it's, it's less obvious these days. Like a lot of the tech problems are tech platforms that come out now are much more like nuanced and like much more powerful than I think some of the simpler kind of more focused tools that were, that were coming out and maybe like earlier generations. Yeah. It sounds like, well, the theme that is sort of coming out here is yes, it's creating a new category, whether it's, in a niche or a brand new type of product, but in either case, the the target user has a problem. It's just it's on the marketer. It's the marketer's job to label that problem and give the potential user the vocabulary to then talk about that challenge and find the solution. Almost, totally. it's just making them aware of that of that pain, as you're saying. Totally, I think I think that's right on, and I think that's like true if it's category creation or sort of resegmentation like that's that that sort of use of language particularly with software you know like finding your space linguistically like yep we we occupy this yeah. space um and committing to it and and you know that i that's i i think like a huge piece of it and um you know people are influenced by each other and so like mm -hmm. your your hope as as a marketer is that you create a logical enough concept that like it doesn't matter that much what it's called as long as it's not like painful to say like if the concept yeah. is just right and clearer than what you had before then someone will take it and they will be the messenger internally we're like i think this is what we need because you know people are incentivized to you know to help themselves and so like if this concept that they learn through your marketing can go help them succeed at their work and get promoted and grow, then like that's that's what they're trying to do. They don't actually live for that concept. Um, but uh, I, I think you know that's so much of like the way this all works is you know, clarity and, and like repeatable language that you put out there to help kind of market the problems you're solving of which people then communicate it, you know, among their circles. Yeah. Yeah, getting to B2B marketing is like finding that champion and arming them with the vocabulary and materials they need. Exactly. Um, so I, I'm curious. So I, I brought a HubSpot. I'm curious on your end, what companies have done or are doing this category creation or creating demand well? Like if you were to do a case study on three companies, which, which ones would those be? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I'm the the expert. I think, like, I mean, it's interesting because it's, it's it's all about sort of like a moment in time. I don't I don't feel yeah. like any company just sustains this sort of pace of category creation. Because if you're successful, then like it becomes a standardized term. Then you got more competition, and so it depends where you are in the arc of that. Um, I mean, like, obviously, Apple. Um, continues to sort of like blow people's minds and and you know like the apple watch i think like very much 
like moved fast and created the wearables market, the wearables market then created all this health data that they didn't quite expect to happen. And now there's this whole market of sort of digital health that they're like seemingly like running faster with than anyone even realized. Yeah. And like, and so for them, like they're, they're the ultimate case study because they continue to create new categories, then watch the behavior of consumers, which then creates new sort of adjacent categories and they just keep going and it's incredible to watch. Um, and I think, you know, they've, their ethos has kind of like historically always been like, well, it's for us, it's not just about sort of like user research and asking people what they want, like mm-hmm. per- particularly in sort of the jobs <coughs> era, it's like, we're, we're going to show them what they want. They don't know what they want. We are going to lead them and we are going to change things quicker than they might like, but they will adapt and we're going to, we're going to lead rather than sort of like follow just the research. Um, and I always kind of, thought that was like I mean, it's hard to know I haven't worked there so I don't know like how much of it is true versus the mythology of it but it does kind of feel that way and it does even piss you off sometimes when they you know they get rid of the the like connector the power adapter that you're used to yeah like, that was a big thing why do my headphones not work anymore but but they you know they are kind of like <laughs> relentless in progress um you know one company I, that on the, like the B2B side that I, <clears throat> um, I think moved fast. Like, I don't think they are a permanently sort of successful content creator, but I thought for like a time was <clears throat> impressive. The, like the velocity they were moving at was, was drift, you know, drift, yeah, yeah. drift came in and took the chat bot <laughs> market and turned it into the conversational marketing market. And I think they were, one of the real drivers there, if not the driver. And I remember like searching on the term conversational marketing and they were the first result. And it was like a deep dive, you know, explanation of what this was. And it felt like a very sort of inbound marketing moment. And, you know, perfect example, like these opportunities still exist. Like this was only a few years ago. And I think what's hard though, is like, just I think just the market moves faster and then very quickly lots of companies had conversational marketing products and I think they've probably already like evolved into new things but like I I thought the way they came out of the gates was pretty fresh um and they dressed up the chatbot like it was still chatbot at the end of the day yeah (laughs) but they did a great job that was a a great strategy Yeah. yeah um and uh who else? Hmm. I mean, definitely Slack, you know, and Slack, but Slack just feels like they executed on a product level. Like, it seemed like something, like, it's a perfect example of, like, solving a problem I didn't know I had. And, like, yeah. I, in so many different ways. Like, I remember when they came out, I was like, I have so many ways to do instant messenger right now. I definitely, yeah. this is not a problem that I feel I have. This feels like a solved problem. Yeah, and back I then, I think we were using HipChat and we immediately swapped over to Slack. Like it was, a, looking back relatively, it was a really quick transition. We just, everyone just immediately got onto it for, for whatever reason. Yep. Well, <laughs> I think it's like, yeah, I mean, I, I think they're simultaneously solving a lot of problems that I didn't know I had. Like, I remember being like, I've got chat. That's not a problem. And then I got Slack. I was like, oh, like a chat that like really does work perfectly between my desktop and my phone and that I can now share files on no matter what device it is and actually like look at these files. And like, wow, I had no idea this was a problem I had. And now I can never go back because no chat application can do any of this additional stuff. Um, and like, I think the marketing is pretty good, but to me, like, that's a very product led company, um, that like, it, it just continued to sort of like exceed expectations uh, of what it can be. And I think the marketing does a good job of like telling stories of, of how people are using it. Yeah. The, the interesting thing about this whole conversation is category creation is not it's not a sh- you can't have a short term horizon in thinking about it. Like you can't be thinking about tactics that you expect to get some benefit from overnight. And one of the trends that we tend to see is 
in like talking about how to grow a business or how to grow a social media following or grow an email list. A lot of it is short term thinking like here, here are 10 hacks to do that. So it's kind of, here's how to do something overnight. So in a world that's driven around this narrative of do something really fast, you've built a career on something that takes a long time to do, building new categories. Uh, how did you develop that mindset and how did your career end up shaping that way? Yeah, I mean, I think get sort of to go back to where we started the conversation of like, how did, how did I go from music to working in tech marketing? I think like I am just naturally drawn towards the new, what it, the, the next thing, like the new stuff. I, I like, <clears throat> like it's cliche, but like I like disruption um, mm -hmm. and, and, and sort of breaking, breaking the mold. And so I, I do think on some level, like I'm wired that way. And I, I think I was, you know, like that with music too. Like I never played in a cover band. I didn't like covering other people's songs. <laughs> I liked writing songs. I liked creating new things that had never existed before and mashing up sort of different styles that I liked into my, my thing. Um, so I think I'm just kind of wired that way a little bit. Um, so I will say that I also didn't go into it with a lot of clarity of like, wow, this is really hard. It does take a long time Yeah. and you're not that likely to succeed. Um, but I think, you know, your nature is what it is. And, uh, I do think like, you know, those are good environments to work in when, um, when you feel like you got a shot, you know, when you feel like, yeah, we are, we really are trying to bring something new to the table here. We feel like this is, this insight is right about the market. Um, and <coughs> the challenge now is just to like run as fast as possible and drive awareness as fast as possible and execute as fast as possible. Like, you know, if you feel good about like the likelihood to succeed, category creation or like you know, sort of resegmentation opportunities are are really fun, and they do they can move pretty fast. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'll create a little soundbite for you here, maybe a metaphor for life for marketers, but people should do less covers and write more original music. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, I think it's pretty right on. Yeah. Um, all right, so I, I know I know we're coming up on time, so maybe before we go, I have some rapid fire questions for you, um, just just to go through. So first one is, who do you admire professionally and why? Um, Tom Brady. Yeah. Uh, just execution. The goat. Lo longevity. Roger Federer as well. Same thing. Yeah, it's interesting over the years watching tennis finals and it's always the same three guys. Yeah. Um, the longevity is impressive. I think Tom, uh, Tom York, Radiohead, same thing. Yeah. Just like, I really appreciate just like the continued sort of like excellence and high level execution. I think as, I, as I've gotten older, like that sort of like sticking, <laughs> staying at that level has become like more and more like impressive to me. Yeah. I wonder if your answer to this next question might be the same, but if you could have dinner with one person dead and one person alive, who would they be? Hmm. Um, I'd like to have dinner with JFK, um, dead, and one person alive. I mean, maybe I'll stick with the president thing. Would love to have dinner with, with Obama. <laughs> yeah, of course. And so as someone who's... Uh, kind of, I'm going to say at the cusp of, of marketing, if you're creating a new category, uh, what blogs or podcasts, substacks or people do you like to follow right now? I mean, so I work in B2B marketing. Um, I, I haven't found like a lot of focus stuff um, that just like really speaks to my day to day. But I do think like Dave Gerhardt is just right on that tip. So like I, you know, I, I usually start there, but then he's got a good selection of folks that come on his thing. And then from there it kind of leads me usually to like other stuff. So like April Dunford also quite strong. Mm -hmm. And I think I discovered her through a Gerhardt interview. Um, yeah, the two of them, I feel like I can continually sort of get like good insights from. Yeah. 
What about outside of marketing? What what else? What sort of content or people are you following? Hmm. I so I mean I live in San Francisco and I'm kind of like obsessed with San Francisco like history, um, and San Francisco is obviously like a major tech hub, and so yeah, so much of what I kind of like digest these days are you know San Francisco like people on you know Twitter and blogs and and content just because i find this like talks about music talks about tech talks about the place yeah. i live um and so you know i actually think like the chronicle and sf gate actually are pretty interesting um and t- they talk about they talk about tech in a different way they talk about the history of it because these are like homebrew homegrown companies um and yeah, it's hard to say like I, I i live in the feed you know like i yeah. i'm so i'm so not loyal for the most part to publications it's what people posted and whether it's interesting and you know obviously like i guess new york times like i read every day but other than that it's just like i open I, I i use feedly as my like aggregator and and feedly i just got like all across the board like design music tech lifestyle like just all mashed up into the feed yeah i i remember hearing of feedly is it a a good replacement for the old Google Reader. Yeah, I think okay. Feedly. I I I mean I don't know. The, uh, there's lots of out there. Like it's just worked for me. I just found it yeah. like gets the job done on easily adding stuff in, presenting it nicely, working really well on multiple devices. Easy to sort of like bookmark things, fi- find my way back to them. Um, and uh, and I also think they got the name right. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Like, at a, a previous company like we were just obsessed with the feed because we we're like dude this is so different so transformative like the feed is a different way of life than what we had before and i i just think we all just live in a feed but we don't take a step back to think about the feed a lot and it's it, you know you certainly do if you work at facebook and you work on the news feed team and you do if you're a few other companies but i think there's so much of us just live within it without kind of thinking about the like paradigm that they're in there. Um, so yeah, I don't know that that's a absolute tangent there, but, um, no, I love it. Yeah. It is. It's a great name and, uh, I'm going to be significantly more aware of me scrolling through feeds now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's, what's something you've recently purchased that you find yourself recommending often? Uh, it's a new tennis racket. Got a Wilson Pro staff. Quite excellent. Awesome. And where where can listeners find you on the internet? Yeah, um, yeah, pretty pretty active on LinkedIn. Um, pretty easy to find me there. And then uh, on Twitter, more more of a listener than a poster, but at cousin Chris. And uh, cousin Chris is the name of the, like the last band I was in, and so you uh-huh. can get to music stuff through like my bio and, and twitter awesome we'll we'll make sure to link to those in the show notes and is there anything you'd like to say to the audience before we sign off yeah i, I if you've made it this long congratulations I, it's it's good good to be with you and uh now now go on with your day <laughs> <laughs> great i think that's a good place to end it then thanks so much for the time chris enjoyed the conversation yeah likewise